Welcome to the Virtual Memories Show. I'm your host, Gil Roth, and we're here to preserve and promote culture in this benighted age, one weekly conversation at a time. You can subscribe to the Virtual Memories Show through iTunes or by plugging our RSS feed into your favorite podcatcher. You can find the RSS feed on our websites, vmspod.com or chimeraobscura.com slash vm. We're also on Twitter and Instagram at vmspod, at virtualmemoriespodcast.tumblr.com, and on Spotify, YouTube, and tunein.com by searching for Virtual Memories Show. And visit patreon.com slash vmspod or paypal.me slash vmspod to make a one-time or recurring donation and help me continue to produce smart conversation about books, art, comics, and culture every week at the Virtual Memories Show. It's another double episode week. I know I posted the Simon Critchley one just a couple of days ago, but... I've gotten pretty far ahead on shows, and some of them are time-sensitive, like when the guest has a book debuting, like this week's guest, and so I want to make sure we get those out as well as the ones I recorded a while ago so the guests don't feel like they're being, they're being ignored or anything, so, so here we are with our second episode of the week. Sylvia Nickerson is our guest this time around. Her debut graphic novel just came out this week. It's called Creation, and it's published by Drawn and Quarterly. Uh, Creation's a mighty impressive debut. Sylvia manages to tell the story of of decay and redevelopment slash gentrification in her city of Hamilton, Ontario, and dovetails it with her own experiences of becoming a mother and trying to sustain herself as an artist. Um, it's That's too simple a way of putting it, even though those are some pretty complicated themes to bring up. Creation is done primarily in watercolors. It's in black and white, but it's done in watercolors, and most of the figures are vague. They're just gestural outlines, generally, that people don't have uh, details to them. They're just shapes that are uh, shaded. Well, the backgrounds of the city and, and the neighborhoods are almost painfully sharp in, in detail, and it's it's this really arresting effect that she uses, and it, it sort of helps drive home the idea that the the city reflects its inhabitants just as we respond to the environment that we're in and that the more people are together the less we we seem to to pay attention to each other or to understand each other we become just shapes uh, against a, a harsh background so sylvia manages to convey a lot about urban policy without coming off as strident um there's a lot of tension about gentrification, as I said, and, and development that's conveyed in the book, but it's it's never one-sided. This isn't a, you know, a rant per se. It, it really tackles some of the tough questions of what to do with a city when industry, or what, what a city should do when, when industry has left it and um, things are falling apart and who can help kind of restore it or, you know, give it some sort of life. So what she does through the course of the book she really manages to invest a lot of humanity into these visibly detailless people um, and and tell us a lot about this city and maybe some of the lessons that can apply to, to other cities as they go through this sort of process. Uh, anyway, I'm just glad the people at Drawn and Quarterly got us together to, to record at Small Press Expo this month because you know me, I'm biased against anyone younger than me, and so I wouldn't have come across this book on my own. And, and they sent me a review copy. I was just, oh, my God, this is this is something. We need to get together. So um, all thanks to Drawn and Quarterly, and thank you, Sylvia, for, for making the time. Now, speaking of Small Press Expo, this is one of three episodes that I recorded during SPX weekend uh, earlier this month. I am headed to Cartoon Crossroads Columbus, or CXC, this upcoming weekend, uh, where I'll be recording a few more episodes and also moderating some sessions, which will likely get recorded for future episodes of the show. So what I'm saying is you can expect more double episode weeks coming up. As caveats go, we recorded pretty early in the morning so that Sylvia would have time to get to her signing at the SPX show floor. Now here's Sylvia's bio from the book. Sylvia Nickerson is a comics artist, writer, and illustrator who lives in Hamilton, Canada. 
Her focus is storytelling and community arts and writing comics examining parenthood, gender identity, social class, and religion. Her illustrations have appeared in The Globe and Mail, The National Post, The Boston Globe, and The Washington Post, and her comics have been nominated for a Doug Wright Award. Her new book is Creation, published by Drawn and Quarterly. And now, the Virtual Memories Conversation with Sylvia Nickerson. Tell me about your intro to comics and where it began. We'll talk about creation overall, okay. but, but where did comics begin for you? Um, right. Well, I, I, I was always interested in the arts growing up and I did have an idea that I wanted to be an artist, but it wasn't comics particularly that mm. I, as a kid that I thought, Oh, that's what I want to do. But there was comics in my life. Um, um, one of the things that was sort of, uh, sentimental for me was like my mom and dad my my dad used to draw comics um for my mom like when they were uh like yeah. falling in love or whatever um and they would still have some around the house when I was growing up and uh I found that really touching um and I didn't read a lot of um funny comics but we definitely had an interest in politics. So, you know, I probably read editorial cartoons and things like that. Um, I always drew a lot. Um, uh, so, but in terms of like the world that I'm introduced to now, I guess that I'm a part of now, it was really only after I finished art school. So I, I'd gone to an, an arts centric high school, which was really great. I did a lot of art there. And then, um, and then I did art in university, art in mathematics. And, um, when I finished that, uh, I was really, uh, I don't know, like a, a lot of traditional art training is, I didn't know how to go on as an artist with a lot of that. Yeah. So I was just in floundering terms of it around being too restrictive or what, what was it? Um, that... I guess I just, I just didn't know what kind of an artist I wanted to be. Oh. And I didn't know how I wanted it to relate to, you know, money or like my life or mm -hmm. many things. So, uh, I was trying to figure that out. Um, I was doing making sculpture, um, and not making very much money at it and feeling kind of discouraged. Um, I'd applied to some MFA programs and didn't get in. But anyway, at the time, one of my friends who had also done sculpture was, uh, had a job doing that and he was reading comics. This was maybe in 2003, four, um, and graphic novels for fun. And, and he was like, you should really read some of this stuff. It's really great. So that was when I started, um, picking up, um, like Persepolis and some other popular comic yeah. graphic novels at the time and finding those just, yeah, wonderful. And, and also, I remember hearing um, Art Spiegelman interviewed on the radio when I was young and loving some of the things he said, some of the kind of cultural commentary he gave about images and how images can comment on culture and images versus, you know, art versus advertising. And anyway, I, I always, that always stuck with me. So, yeah, I guess that was my introduction to comics. But at the time, I never um, thought I would do comics. I, I got into illustration. I did, uh, like, editorial illustrations, and I was working as a commercial illustrator. And and then, um, yeah, this much later now, it's like 15 years later now, I'm getting into comics. <laughs> yeah. Uh, was it an act of rebelling against your illustration background to have no no faces in, in creation or, or not? No. Okay. Uh, <laughs> No, um, I mean, I, I did try at, along the line. I, I don't think I'm a terrible portraitist. I wouldn't say it's like what I've always wanted to do is draw people's faces. But no, when I was doing illustration, I remember uh, making an illustration where um, I drew a kind of ghostly simplified figure. It was for an assigned story. So in many cases, you have to work with what you're given. You're yeah. not. Yeah. Um, and the background was really detailed and I remember thinking, oh, like there's something in that, um, I'd like to work with that more. Like that ghostly the, presence. Well, the idea mm -hmm. that the 
the figure, the person is very not detailed, very simplified, mm -hmm. but the environment is very specific. Mm -hmm. So I just found that that was maybe a way where, you know, you could enter it and kind of experience the environment, but you didn't need to know a lot about the yeah. person or that you could find out about the person through their experience of the environment. So I just felt like it was more, um, like resonated with something about how I feel about the world, like as a person going around in the world. Yeah. So yeah. Get making the universal without having to be hyper specific in particular about the, the individuals. Yeah. I guess. But I, yeah. I mean, like there's a lot of great, uh, like movies, comics or whatever, where it is yeah. very hyper specific using how the person looks that I love, but it yeah. just, yeah, something about doing that for me resonated. And then, um, as a couple of people have noticed, I guess in the book and I have another book too, and it, I do it in that book too. Um, I use these kind of generalized figures and then at some points in the story, they became, ve they become very specific in certain yeah. panels and then they go back to being kind of like placeholders. So, um, I guess I've used that as kind of a, a device for, um, like I call it a sort of like emotional resonance. Like you're kind of going along in the world and you experience a lot of people, but like how deeply do you experience right. them or know them or connect with them? Like oftentimes not very deeply or you don't really know them or you don't really care. Or, um, but then sometimes there'll be, you know, moments or situations or relationships where you have, um, you all of a sudden feel quite close to someone or bonded or like you've had a mo like you, yeah, yeah it becomes everything's hypersensitive. Yeah. 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 And so I tried to use that as a way to give that to the reader where, you know, they're following along these like little amorphous things. And then maybe at some point it'd be like, Oh, like now I see the person or now yeah. I see it's, it's like a, something that has more of a form. So Yeah. And what was your quote unquote comics training? You know, how did you, you know, start finding your way through actually making these? Uh, I didn't, I don't really have any comics training, but I did write, um, like academic articles cause I was, uh, you are a PhD. Of, so I, uh, I, I don't know yeah, if I should call well, you a doctor or, or no, not, so. <laughs> <laughs> but I did write a lot. I was, I was working a lot in academics and writing a lot of academic articles and that, requires a certain kind of writing and mm -hmm. so I th I guess because of that I started to think a lot about story and history and you know you read a lot of documents personal documents people left behind but then also you you think a lot about how sometimes in academics you spend a lot of time working on things and you know people work their entire careers and maybe by the end they come up with some really brilliant idea about something and how many people will ever read it? It's not always in a very accessible. Yeah. So the idea of trying to write really directly and accessibly and maybe also in a kind of a more raw way really appealed to me after all of this kind of um, yeah. contrived writing <laughs> or whatever. Uh, uh, academia can be very jargon heavy also. It can be, it's, yeah. yeah. It's just kind of behind a wall, you yeah. know, a little bit. So. So I didn't really have a lot of training, but I thought, okay, like I've, I did do commercial illustration for like 10 years more or less. And that, that was a certain, like definitely developed me a lot doing that and developed a certain kind of discipline, um, and maybe a style too, to the, to illustrating that I could go to. And I had, uh, collected a lot of documents and stuff for this book and, for creation. Um, but I started writing a few shorter comics and some of those became part of this other book I wrote called all we have left is this. So, um, I guess I tried with a couple of shorter comics first. So just building it up on your own. Yeah. You know, that's, that's, it's something I talk about with some of the older cartoonists. I ask occasionally whether they would have wanted the sort of comics education, the the the, the college version of, of comics that's out there. And most of them are like, no, I, I sort of had to figure it out for myself. I'm glad I figured yeah. it out for myself instead of going through, you know, 
a college course or a series of, you know, an MFA program in comics. Instead, it's more self-discovery of, of the art form, what works and what doesn't work. So, so I'm glad you're keeping up that tradition. So good. Yeah. 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 Tell me about the creation of, of creation and, and Hamilton, um, where it all is said and takes place. You know, how did the, the book really start for you or the, the impetus to get it going? Right. Well, um, I guess I moved to Hamilton in 2007, eight, and, uh, I actually spent time as a teenager growing up not very far from Hamilton. Um, I grew up in some different towns in Ontario, but I spent my, my teenage years in like suburban North Oakville, which is in like, you know, not very far away, but we never really spent much time in Hamilton. So when I moved there, I, it was a real discovery. I was like, wow, there's this whole place here and it's really interesting. And so I did find the city inspiring. Um, it just, well, I guess it was like a magic, like it was a discovery that it was, it was, had been so close to me growing up, but I never knew anything about it or that it was Mm -hmm. there because a lot of people in the greater Toronto area are focused on Toronto and downtown Toronto is like the center. Um, so I guess, you know, a lot of the media comes from downtown Toronto. So if you're just a person, you're not necessarily know what's going on over there. So, um, yeah, you know, go for long bike rides. There were um, a lot of old buildings that were interesting. Um, a lot of neighborhoods um, that I just thought, wow, like, what's the his- like? What's the history here? And I guess over time, I've learned more of that history. Um, Hamilton has two really big steel mills that have been operating for over a hundred years. Um, and I guess in the last you know, 20 years, they were sold off to international steel conglomerates and then um, in different degrees of still operating with certain sh- shutdowns. So there's a large population of people who for generations worked in the in the steel industry. Um, and, you know, so there's a lot of retirees who worked in the steel industry. And then um, there's a huge co- connection to that to that work and and many people came from many places in Canada and the world to work there so there's a really interesting population of people who came from Mm. all of these places to get jobs in steel and then develop their own cultural associations community associations and um kind of uh all their own you know bakeries or food or so it's a, just a really interesting place. And, and then, you know, more recently I learned the labor history and the struggles and, um, of some of the, the steel workers. And, but a lot of that history is not that obvious when you go there. Um, some of those de- neighborhoods where in the ind- industry used to house people have been demolished. And I think Hamilton has, um, like the city hall, people sometimes, you know, have an interesting relationship with like that history where they'll take on these big civic projects, these big grand civic projects, and then they'll end up ripping down a whole bunch of stuff. And yeah, so I don't know. And I found all of that, um, kind of inspiring. And I guess I also realized that there was a sort of commitment in my own life. Like I was just moving to this place and I was moving there because I loved someone, not because I necessarily chose it, but um, I was going to have to make this work for me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And then it turned into the act of creation. Yeah. Well, I, I moved there and then, you know, not too long after I, I, I was trying to connect with the city. So I, uh, I rented a studio where this kind of, art scene was developing that I had heard about and was trying to connect with that. And then after a year or two, I had a baby and then I was still trying to connect with that art scene. And, and then I had to fit into the neighborhood as a mother. And, um, and, and so that really took me on a different kind of a journey actually. Yeah. Yeah, Can you talk about that? Cause motherhood slash parenthood is, is, well, the trigger for the book as yeah. it, as it starts out, um, can talk about how it informs the book and, and again, that balancing act of motherhood and, and being an artist. Yeah. 
uh, motherhood and being an artist was hard. I mean, I remember when I was pregnant, people would say, oh, just wait, like, you know. It's all going to change. Oh, yeah. And I just was like, that's made me so mad. As I think I've heard many people have this well, reaction. Chris Ware yesterday said the most important thing in his life, but at the same time, you know, changes everything in terms of. It changes of, everything. Yeah. And that's yeah. from a, a father side, but it was still you know, being a work at home dad. But anyway, yeah. Yeah, it changes everything. So, I mean, I, I was really, uh, I'm a really stubborn person. And so I was like, oh, you think so? Yeah. Just wait. <laughs> I'll show you. I'm going to show you. <laughs> um, so I, I did a lot of illustrations, like overnight, you know, like staying up yeah. all night, um, meeting my deadlines in that first year, thinking I was not going to change anything. And um, yeah, I probably nearly burned myself out <laughs> that first year. Did do a lot of good illustrations that year, but um, it was really hard. Um, but yeah, in terms of how it it makes you, I just found it because I spent a lot of time with my son during the day. You don't do the same things that you used to do because your main job is um, yeah, like what the baby needs. So you know you don't. Um, you're not going to work like other people in an office or you're not going to a coffee shop or you're not, you can't just go for um, a bike ride when or you feel even like if it. you're going to get on the bus or things, you know, you're pushing a stroller. Um, so you think about accessibility. So I started to think about people, you know, like it was a really bad winter that winter and you can't get your stroller through the, through the snow piled across the road and things like that. I started thinking about more people who are impacted by those kinds of issues. So Yes, I found it um, was an act of empathy. Like, not only does it break down your own barriers between you and the baby, because that's a huge thing, where you're so connected with this other being that you don't really have a sense of individuality as much as you did, or at least for me. Um, so that was that's kind of a radical thing, yeah. <laughs> because our our society is so individualistic. Um, I was such a focus on, focus on that. But then it also broke it down where it was not only me empathizing with my baby, but also with like people at large, I felt like, um, yeah. And yeah, I just, uh, I really started to see, I, I would take long walks and I really started to see um, like other people who clearly had nowhere to be or nowhere to go all day. And I would, I would see them every day because it was like me and them doing the rounds. So yeah, that was another thing. It was like, um, started to observe, um, other people who were living in my neighborhood, but who before my habits and routines hadn't ever brought my awareness into like sort of into contact with them. Um, and we lived, uh, pretty close to a food bank and emergency shelter um, and soup kitchen and a lot of social services in downtown Hamilton. And uh, I, re I remember the first day we moved in and um, I started every day. I was like, wow, there's, there's a lineup for the food bank every day. And it never went away every day. Yeah. So, you know, it's another one of those things where you know about that, like intellectually. Yeah. And then but when you when you experience yeah. it, you're like, right. And there will never be an end to people who need to go to the food bank. Like they may sh like sort of um, shuffle through. Like some yeah. people might have a time where they need that and then they yeah. get off of that. But the food bank will yeah. never go away. Right. <laughs> and the emergency shelter will never go away. So it's been interesting living in a neighborhood like that because, yeah, you uh, you realize many things about it. Has the, from the 12 or so years you've been there, has the poverty situation worsened or has, you, you indicate some measures where it doesn't necessarily worsen, but it, you know, it's covered up differently. And, yeah, and I think that areas. is true. It, it, the neighborhood is changing. And I do think that, um, the financial crisis, the years after the financial crisis were impactful mm -hmm. on like the working poor and. I don't know. I think it was worse. Um, people needing to access those things. Is it changing? I don't know. Um, I think there's always going to, it's always going to be a need for it. But uh, yeah, as I said in the book, um, well, the street where I used to have my studio has been completely changed and is now like a evening entertainment district. Yeah. 
Um, so certain things have changed and, and so, um, I'm sure that there are maybe places or hangouts where things have moved around the city a little bit. Yeah. yeah. Oh, we're at SPX. I don't know if you've, you've been to the, the show before, but behind the hotel is this fancy mixed use retail. Yeah, I went dining there last night. yeah. Uh, until about five or six years ago, ruins. Right, you know, right, th- this right. is all new and this is yeah. all, you know, hip happening, et cetera. But in the past, it was just this sort of burned out wreck of, of buildings. So, yeah, things things change. They, you know, rejuvenate. But gentrification actually is, you know, one of your major, major themes and whether there are uh, casualties of that. Yeah, is, uh, I actually think like so um, the publisher and a lot of people in Hamilton have decided the books about gentrification, which is like totally fine with me. But I was like, this is really f- interesting because it's like a lot of things like on the left we call it gentrification in the rest of the world they call it development yeah yeah and on (laughs) and on um in canada we have uh like um in alberta we have if you're on the left you call it the tar sands which is like the oil extraction area and if you're in the mainstream you call it the oil sands (laughs) it's like nicer (laughs) um so anyway i just thought that's interesting because i don't know it's uh I mean, These you, things you, can be seen in many different sure. and, ways. And, and that's what right? you bring up, that dynamic yeah. intention. It's it's not simply, you know, the, the tar and feathering of, of gentrification. You show, you know, these art spaces and things wouldn't exist. You wouldn't have those opportunities necessarily. And it's, you know, you can't simply let things fall into to absolute disrepair and, and poverty. So, yeah, it's a... Uh, that's a complicated issue. It yes. is, yeah. Um, but you do a good job of at least, you know, demonstrating and showing what some of the human aspects, not just human costs, but, you know, some of the human benefits, too. So. Okay. So I'm impressed. It, it's a good job. Um, what did you learn about yourself in the process of making the book? Besides that you're capable of making right. a significant comic. Yeah. Um, I yeah. use comic instead of graphic novel. Oh, I'm sorry. That, that's no, just my that's, term that's of fine. It's okay. totally fine. Um yeah, well, the, it was a journey of discovery for me. I think that when I had the had my baby, I was uh, I didn't feel like I had a lot of um, adult conversation space, and I had a lot of thoughts about many things, and I was angry about certain things, and I I didn't always feel like I had the space to express that, so I um, started writing things down, and some of it was about you know poverty or like different things in my neighborhood and some of it was about um just I guess motherhood and you know I mean when I started writing the book and and you distance yourself from your narrative voice as you do it I was like wow you know it really was hard to transition from a kind of (laughs) self-centered My mom says I'm very millennial. So <laughs> as a sort of self-centered older millennial to yeah. um, being what you have to be to be um, truly care about something else and put that first. Um, and that was a hard like transition. Mm-hmm. Um, so it made me reflect on that. And I didn't, um, I didn't always want to admit that it was hard at the time or talk about it. Hmm. So um, I think it was helpful for me to go over that and then just let it go. Yeah. Yeah. Because sometimes when you hang on to things like that, you know, your anger can go very... It can fester. It can become, yeah, ugly. (laughs) And then it starts impacting your relationships and things like that. So... It was really, I think it's been good for me in that, in that sense. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Now, you, you mentioned uh, people perceiving the book in certain ways. What's the reception been like for it so far, specifically in, in Hamilton? In itself? Hamilton, yeah. Well, I mean, I'm hoping, like, I'm going to find out more in the yeah, next I know it's, few it's, months. It's pretty early, but yeah. Yeah. Um, well, I, I don't know. Like, okay. I'm a little nervous about that. Mm-hmm. Um, I think I've been thinking about that and I think, you know, maybe I'm nervous about it, but maybe it also means that sometimes like through this art, I feel like it's, um, it can be a renegotiation of terms between you and whatever your subject is. 
Yeah. And so I feel like didn't know I needed it, but maybe um, to sort of stay in Hamilton and in my neighborhood going forward for the rest of my time, I really did need to renegotiate my relationship with it. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I mean, I guess uh, most gentrifiers probably move into a neighborhood and and stay and then, you know, when property values go up, they, they sell and move on. Right. <laughs> um, I don't think I'm, I don't think that's going to be my path here. So, um, yeah, I need to renegotiate what that is and, and be me through the book, whether people like it or not. Mm-hmm. Um, so I guess I feel good that I did write the book. Um, but I still feel like there are, there are tensions in, in Hamilton and in my neighborhood that I still feel, I don't think it will make those things go away. Um, so the arts communities embraced it. Yeah. Um, I would really like it if, um, you know, some of the politicians would read it maybe and think about it. Um, when they make some of their decisions about approving different developments in the downtown, but I don't know or if they would cleaning up the toxic waste. Yeah. Spills. That, that site yeah. actually has been cleaned up and is slated oh. for development now. Um, but there's lots of other, mm-hmm. uh, brownfield sites in Hamilton and it's very expensive to clean these things up very hard. I, I, in my home in Northern New Jersey, there is a, uh, uh, environmental, concern because of Ford, the motor company, yeah. uh, dumping paint back in the 60s and 70s because it was all woods back unreal. then and yeah. everything is bubbling up into the reservoirs wow. and, and all that. But but yeah, that's uh, legacies of, of, you know, industry yeah. and development. Yeah, yeah I kind of think, you know, with my some of my immediate neighbors in Hamilton, I, I don't know because I, I do feel like, you know, it's, it's kind of ridiculous that I've written this book. Like some of them will be like... Uh, I had somebody tell me, well, you wrote a book about wiping people's bums. Why would you do that or something? Well, I guess they'd looked at the first page. Yeah, that's, so, that's, you know, I mean, people have all kinds of ideas, but yeah. I'm not sure that, uh, like, I don't know. I guess, you know, art is accessible so everyone can have an opinion and, and that's how it should be. Yeah. <laughs> so we'll see <laughs> what happens. Um, what was it like from what I was reading the, the, you did installments of the book as, um, exhibitions in, in art spaces along with I did, yeah. some 3d modeling I did, or some sculptures, I guess, uh, of that. How did that, you know, did feedback from that inform how you worked on the, the rest of the book or what was the experience, I guess, of, of exhibiting, parts of the, the book as it was in progress. Yeah, I showed the first three chapters and I was really nervous about it. Um, probably like the most nervous I've been to show an artwork ever. Yeah. And, um, but you know, like I survived, yeah. <laughs> so it was fine. Um, and it was, it was good. I, I was part of this art space for a while with, um, m- artists, a few of my own age and, and many who were younger and they were, um, I'd really kind of given up believing in art for, for a while. Like I just was like ready to stop because, you know, I had two kids and I was almost, uh, I had a contract to work in like an academic environment. And I thought, okay, now it's my time to grow up. And this thing that I've been like pursuing and dumping money down the drain on it forever. Like, yeah. what have I been like, what a waste of time. And you know, what has it ever done for me? Welcome to the self doubt club. Um, <laughs> yeah, you know, really like, so I was pretty much ready to pack it in. And, um, then these students, art students from Montreal moved into the right next door to me. And like, literally we shared a wall and they were looking for studio space and they had all this energy. And I just thought, wow, that's so a great, you know, they have all this energy and dreams and, you know, things like that. Anyway, we ended up sharing a studio space and they had so much energy and really believed in art and were putting on shows and, um, you know, creating a free space for a community to do things. And I don't know, really did inspire me. Like inspiration is real, you know? Yeah. 
And so at some point they were like, well, everyone here gets to have a show and it's your turn. And I, and I thought, <laughs> Whoops. oh man. But what I mean is like, I know I didn't want to, it sounds really naive and stupid, but I didn't want to let them down. Cause I was like the older one, <laughs> yeah. you know, I, who'd been at this a long time. And I thought, I can't like, I want to do, I, I don't want to like, they believe, you know, yeah. I want to do something good. So, so this motivated like the whole book, I had to actually write it, you know? Yeah. And so, yeah, the first three chapters, but I wasn't sure anyone would ever read it because I had no audience or readership. So I was needed more motivation to keep going. So the show helped with that because I yeah. realized people were interested. And doing uh, sculptures or models along with it, was that a was that added after you'd already been doing the comic, or was that part of something that helped inform how you were doing the drawing previously? What came first, I guess? Um, the, the drawings came first, and then somebody just asked me to create something for their store window. Ah. And so I was working on that in the summer, and then my kids got interested, and they made little pieces to go into it. Um, this kind of popped up city yeah. that comes out of the drawings in the book, um, which ties back to the Seth postcard I gave you because he's got that. He's got that the Dominion, Dominion city. city. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I wasn't sure if that was a, an influence. I at all. knew about it, but yeah. um, you know, I mean, I think about it a lot now as being a similar thing, actually, because it very much creates Seth's world, right? Yeah. Um, and and my city does kind of the same thing. But I think it was a bit accidental because they asked me to do this installation and then I thought, I can't really do something separate, so I'm just going to pop up what I'm working on and I'll make it yeah. work in the store window. And then my kids got involved and they really loved the 3D thing. Um, and then um, and then I reinstalled it. I colored it all and reinstalled it um, recently so that it, it has the, more of the vibe of the end of the book, which is more like in color, more vibrant, more like... The way the city is, you know, now, which is kind of like has is chaotic yeah. and it has all of these elements which are difficult, but there's also a lot of um, new energy coming in. Yeah. And how did it get to Drawn and Quarterly? At what point did you feel? Okay, well, yeah. when I was working on the manuscript, I thought, like, hey, what are my goals? And um, yeah, I really thought it would be like my, they would be like my first choice as a publisher because uh, I liked so many of their authors and I liked how they produced their books and they had good distribution. So it was amazing. I mean, I, I sent my stuff off to a number of publishers, just kind of cold emailing to people who accept submissions. And it seems like most people never check their submissions pile because yeah. <laughs> it took a very, like I didn't yeah. hear back from anybody. Um, but I think Either Drawn and Quarterly did check their submissions pile, or um, they have an author, Joe Ullman, who lives oh, in Hamilton. Yeah. 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 And I think he, I had given him the first three chapters to review, and maybe he put in a good word for me. But anyway, they did look at my stuff that I'd sent in the submission pile, and they considered it. Um, so when they were considering it, I thought, wow, this is really great. <laughs> so it has been yeah. really great. <laughs> and it's a Canadian yeah. publisher, so you get a, a you know the hometown thing. I'm I, very I happy, yeah. Cool. Uh, is this your first SPX, by the way? The small it press is. expo. Yeah. Um impressions so far? I know you 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 know, you've been enjoying it as near as I can tell. Yeah. Anyone you really wanted to see while you're here? Or cartoonists who just sort of, oh my god, it's person X and they're a lot shorter than I thought they were. Uh, well, I, I've i gone around and I've collected a lot from a lot of different um, booths because I want to just discover new people, you know? I mean, uh, we went to the Library of Congress. I mean, I never thought I'd see uh, oh, you like got to go as part Charles of the, Schultz the originals or there was like an Alison Bechdel original from yeah. Dykes to Watch Out For. And so there were like, you know, those are that. That was cool. You didn't have any goals going in, though, in terms of the, I just any... have to say hello to... No, but I mean, X. it is amazing to see people who are, you know, famous in the comics world, like, who are here signing books, and yeah. so, yeah, you know, I, I am a big fan, and, but I think at this point in, in my life, I also realize that, like, nothing is not real, like, all of the stuff that comes to you, it, it all does come from someone. Yeah, someone, <laughs> someone has to make it. Someone yeah. has to make it. it <laughs> 
doesn't just arrive magically. So, um, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. Tell me a little about the, the science background that you have, um, in terms of, I think mathematical printing techniques was the, the, <laughs> the PhD topic, just in terms of whether anything about the, the science training and background you had sort of informs the art or is it something that was just a discrete aspect of your life that you don't really see a connection with, with what um, you're doing now? Yeah, I do. I do see a connection in the sense that, um, I reflected a lot on storytelling when I was giving presentations, like mm -hmm. how you keep an audience interest through a thread, a narrative thread, yeah. um, different contexts, but I think there's keeping an audience in, interested through a narrative thread is, pretty much the yes. same and don't put all of the words on the powerpoint slide just bullet points and you yeah that, that, that. that's true <laughs> from years of going to pharmaceutical related conferences it's the you don't you don't need to put the entire no. contents up on the slide but, but you're yeah. very right about that <laughs> that was slowly i learned that um yeah i don't know i mean i i did study math i liked math a lot um I think, you know, uh, symmetry and things like that maybe influence it a little bit. I do use certain, like, re repetitive things in the book and um, symmetries where the city's, you know, flowing in and out of this, like, pot, a melting pot and things like that. Um, I don't know. Yeah. yeah, I wasn't sure if there was any yeah. interplay or if it's a, that was part of my life, but... Well, I think there has to be interplay because I do, I do, it's all inside yeah. me and it all comes out. So there has to be, but yeah. Not a conscious aspect. So. No. Um, you mentioned another, another piece that you have or another book that you're, is it short stuff? I should just tell me what you're working on next. I guess yeah. it's the, the best way well, to. Well, I can show uh, you the other book. Oh, um, right. and I'm not really working on anything right now, but, um, I think I will be next summer, mm -hmm. um, exactly. and I'm thinking about trying to develop a novel that's more like sci-fi or something, like not realism. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Wowzers. And self, well, not self-published, but through the through the art. It more or less self-published, yeah, yeah. Exactly. And you've been on panels now with with other cartoonists. Yeah, about a, twice. Yeah. yeah. How's that experience been for you? And is it a, I'm the newbie, I'm going to, you know, I'm afraid to, to pipe up or do you, do you actually like chime in? I have well, chimed in. Good, good. Um, like I said, I guess, cause I had a background where I did do that and uh, yeah, my yeah. other contacts, it gave me a little more confidence, mm -hmm. but it is really, it's great to meet other writers and creators. It's, it's really inspiring. Um, because that I, you know, like I said, the book was inspired by those, uh, those people in the art space that I shared with, but that's kind of over and gone now. So I think I'm looking, I'm always looking for that inspiration to keep on going. And so when other people are putting things out there, or discussing their work, I find that really generative, like in terms of being like, I'm, my tank is full and I yeah. can go back and think oh, the, about the, making more, yeah, you know, the, the sense of community that you get out of like yeah. events like this or TCAF also, you know, you find it's, you know, it's yeah. really great. So I'm really grateful that I, you know, drawn quarterly made this happen and I got to come here. Um, because it, I think it really is necessary as an artist. You need that, um, to keep on going because it does drain you to create this kind of stuff. So you have to, find a way to get your nutrition, <laughs> you know, uh, last question. Cause I want to make sure you get back to the show in time. Um, did you draw comics for your spouse when you guys were falling in love? I did. Yeah, I did. They're very embarrassing. <laughs> very I know, inspired by the ones your parents did, or did you, you know, <laughs> not consciously, but, um, who knows? I mean, they weren't uh, they weren't developed on on existing cartoon characters. Yeah. But um, just on us, um, I don't know what he thinks. He maybe he even forgets about it now. <laughs> don't know. <laughs> right, Sylvia, I'll let you get back to the show, and I'm gonna, of course, push off creation on lots and lots of people while we're here. So. Thank you. Thanks so much. And 
And that was Sylvia Nickerson. Her new graphic novel, her debut graphic novel, is Creation from Drawn and Quarterly. I enjoyed it a lot, and I'm looking forward to where she's going next, because basically, having created this, she can go in almost any direction she wants, I think. Uh, she does have that short story collection, All We Have Left Is This, uh, from Casino Press, so keep an eye out for that. Uh, but Creation is really an impressive debut work, and I think it deserves a pretty wide audience. Uh, Sylvia's website is sylvianickerson.ca, and it's got links to her work, a uh, whole lot of interviews and press that she's done, and, and more. So check that out. It's S-Y-L-V-I-A-N-I-C-K-E-R-S-O-N dot C-A, because Canada. She's also on Instagram as Sylvia Nickerson, which is all one word. And after we wrapped, I asked Sylvia, so who you been reading? And we actually got distracted at the very end of that, which was a knock that I thought was housekeeping, but it turned out to be my next guest who just showed up pretty early. You'll be hearing her episode in a couple of weeks. Anyway, if you want to hear Sylvia's answer to that and get some extra conversation, you'll need to become a supporter of the Virtual Memories Show so you can get access to our quarterly bonus podcast, Fear of a Square Planet. The second quarter 2019 episode features an hour of book recommendations and fun conversation with Mark Allen Stamity, David Shields, Michael Carroll, Frederick Tutton, Ursi Sotoropoulos, Caitlin Foisy, Seth, Nina Bunjavak, Stephen Guarnaccia, Hugh Ryan, Bill Griffith, Boris Fishman, and Barbara Nessim. You can support the Virtual Memory Show via patreon.com slash vmspod or paypal.me slash vmspod. I've got all sorts of goals and goodies in place for patrons, including that podcast, patron-only blog that I'm starting to do a little more posting on, handwritten show notes for every episode, which I need to format and post the last hundred of them since I now have a new scanner that lets me zoom them out, and my secret project that I know I'm not going to get back to for a couple of weeks because I'm going to be so busy at my day job putting on this conference in a couple of, well, middle of October. And between balancing that and the podcast and just not wanting to let everybody down, I'm going to let myself down. And you guys, I guess. So anyway, go to patreon.com slash vmspod and support the art of fine conversation. Now, I recorded this one during SPX, or Small Press Expo, weekend in Rockville, Maryland. I used points for my train travel, so no money there, but my garage in Newark was $63 for the three days, hotel was 370 bucks. my lift from Rockville up to the BWI train station, because the metro wasn't running on Sunday and couldn't get me down to Union Station in Washington, was $75. Um, so if you add food, coffee, etc., you end up around 600 bucks for the weekend. Now, I'm not complaining. I got three podcasts out of it, bought some books, had some nice conversations. So it was all worth it. I don't just mean podcast conversations. I got to, to just talk to people in general. But still, if you want to help defray some of the costs of the virtual memory show, like web hosting, travel, equipment, coffee, or just toss me some money because you think this show is worth it, then visit patreon.com slash vmspod or paypal.me slash vmspod and make a one-time or recurring donation. A special thanks go out to Nick Bartosik, Buzz Carter, Michael Hacker, Michael Janizik, Fred Kish, Annie Koyama, Jonathan Kranz, Kevin Katila, Jack Lescamella, Stephen Nadler, Barbara Nessim, Jim Otaviani, Payne Prophet, Dmitry Samarov, Stephen Solomon, Greg Tanner, Ford Thomas, and Armando Veve for going over and above in their support of the Virtual Memories Show. Our music for this episode is Fella by Hal Mayforth. Use with permission from the artist. You should visit my archives to check out my episode with Hal from the summer of 2018 and learn more about his art and painting. And you can listen to his music at soundcloud.com slash Mayforth. And that's M-A-Y, the number four, T-H. And that's it for this week's episode of the Virtual Memories Show. Thanks so much for listening. We'll be back next week with another great conversation. You can subscribe to the Virtual Memories Show and download past episodes at the iTunes Store. You can also find all our episodes and get on our email list at either of our websites, vmspod.com or chimeraobscura.com slash vm. 
You can also follow the Virtual Memory Show on Twitter and Instagram at VMSPod, at virtualmemoriespodcast.tumblr.com, and on YouTube, Spotify, and TuneIn.com by searching for Virtual Memories Show. And if you like this podcast, please tell your pals, talk it up on social media, and go to iTunes, look up the Virtual Memories Show, and leave a rating and maybe a review for us. It all goes to helping us build a bigger audience. You've been listening to the Virtual Memories Show. I'm your host, Gil Roth. Keep reading, keep making art, and keep the conversation going. 